Uh, Representative Durrell. Is there any discussion on either of these items? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Seeing none, item passes unanimous, unanimously. Item number three, to receive the assessor's report on tax relief for the elderly and disabled homeowners program as required under Chapter 95, Article 3, Section 5.1 of the Town Code of Fairfield. This item was heard in committee. Is there any additional follow-up from the body? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Ross, very much for giving us that report. Item number four. To hear an update from the Penfield Building Committee Chairman or his designee regarding the status of the Penfield Building Project. This item was also heard in committee um, and at this time if there is any follow-up for Mr. Bradley, I know there is follow-up for Mr. Tetro, but is there any follow-up for Chairman Bradley this evening? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Bradley, for your update in committee. Mr. Tetro, we did have um, a request for an update on the FEMA reimbursement process that came out of committee. I sent you an email. Would you be able to speak to that issue this evening? Mr. Mayor, we'll be able to speak to that issue. Okay. All right. Well, we can hold this item over and return to it when Mr. Mayor is present. Next item. To hear an update from the Osborne Hill Building Committee Chairman or, his des or her designee regarding the status of the Osborne Hill Building Project. Is Ms. Marshall here? We'll hold that item over as well. Item number six, to consider and act upon the following appointment to the Fair TV Commission as recommended by the Board of Selectmen. Stuart Stresler, unaffiliated 56 Lamplighter Lane, term July 2015 to July 2018. Moved by Representative Garskoff, seconded by Representative Hurley. Is there any discussion on this item? Seeing none, any comment from the public? Seeing none, back to the body. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Item passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Mr. Stressler. Item number seven, to hear, consider, and act upon the following resolution as recommended by the Board of Selectmen. Resolved that Michael C. Tetro, first selectman of the town of Fairfield, is empowered to execute and deliver in the name and on behalf of the town of Fairfield a contract with the Connecticut State Library for an historic documents preser preservation grant. Moved by. Representative Dean, seconded by Representative Braun. Is there any discussion on this item? Seeing none, any comment from the public? <coughs> Back to the body. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Item passes unanimously. Item number eight. To consider and act upon the following resolution as recommended by the Board of Selectmen. Resolved that Michael C. Tetro, first selectman of the town of Fairfield, be and hereby is authorized to apply for the 2015-2017 Fairfield Youth Services State Grant in the amount of $28,985 per year for two years and to execute such documents as are necessary to facilitate, facilitate such application and Further resolve that the town match funds for said grant in the amount of $28,985 are already contained in the fiscal year 2015-16 budget and personnel services and shall be included in the fiscal year 2016-2017 budget and personnel services and further resolved that upon receipt of such grant, grant funds may be expended as set forth in the grant documents. Moved by Representative Hochberg. Seconded by Representative Marks. Is there any discussion on this item? Seeing none, any comment from the public? Back to the body. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Item passes. Item number nine. To hear, consider, and act upon the following resolution as recommended by the Board of Selectmen. 
Resolved that the applications received under the Neighborhood Assistance Act, NAA, program are hereby approved and that the Director of the Community and Economic Development is hereby designated as the Municipal Liaison of the Town of Fairfield for this program. Moved by. <sighs> Representative McCullough, seconded by Representative Dean. Any discussion? Seeing none, any comment from the public? Back to the body, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Item passes unanimously. Item number 10, to hear, consider, and act upon the following resolution as recommended by the Board of Selectmen. Resolved at the program year 41, October 1, 2015, September 30th, 2016, Community Development Block Grant, CDBG, is hereby approved in the amount to be finalized by HUD and further resolved that Michael C. Tetro, first selectman of the Town of Fairfield B, and hereby is authorized to execute any and all necessary documents that facilitate the town's participation in said CDBG program. Moved by Representative Gottlieb, seconded by Representative Timniak. All those in favor signify, oh, is there any discussion? Sorry, I'm rushing myself. <laughs> Seeing none, uh, any comment from the public? Back to the body, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Abstentions, all those voting no. Item pass, oh. Um, Representative Mel Ragno and Representative um, Meyer, sorry. Item passes. Item number 11, to hear, consider, and act upon the following resolution as recommended by the Board of Finance. Whereas federal monies are available under the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Program administered by the State of Connecticut, Department of Housing, pursuant to Public Law 933-383 as amended, and whereas pursuant to Chapter 127C and Part 6 of Chapter 130 of the Connecticut General Statutes, the Commissioner of Housing is authorized to disperse such federal monies to local municipalities and whereas it is desirable and in the public interest that the Town of Fairfield accept the from the state a grant in a sum not to exceed 2316000 in order to undertake a community development block, block grant disaster recovery tranche 2 project Fairfield waste water treatment plant hardening and to execute an assistance agreement therefore should one be offered now therefore be it resolved that the town of Fairfield is cognizant of the conditions and prerequisites for the state assistance imposed by part 6 of chapter 130 of the Connecticut general statutes and that the acceptance by the Town of Fairfield as a Disaster Recovery Community Development Block Grant to be used for the Fairfield Wastewater Treatment Plant Hardening in the amount not to exceed $2.316 million is hereby approved and further resolved that the first selectman is hereby authorized on behalf of the Town of Fairfield to accept and expend said grant and further resolve that the first selectman is hereby authorized on behalf of the town of Fairfield to ex execute any and all documents necessary to secure said grant and further resolved that a bond resolution appropriating $2,316,000,000 for the costs associated with the wastewater treatment plant hardening be and hereby is approved. Moved by Representative Dean, seconded by Representative Braun. Is there any discussion? Representative Garskoff. Hello? Is this on? Yes. Thank you. Josh Garskoff, District 5. Um, so I just had a quick question, I think, about the, um, the town share and the WPCA share. I'm not sure, Madam Moderator, who this should go to. I'm thinking uh, Selectman Kiley might be, although he's writing. But um, I, I had a question about how the determination was made of the town share or the WPCA share. Um, would you care to comment on it? Selectman Kiley. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Madam Moderator. 
Good evening. I believe the question is, um, well, just backing up for a second, um, I am the Board of Selectmen's uh, designee to the uh, WPCA. One member of the Board of Selectmen sits on that board as a voting member, and I've been on for a few months. So I'm still a little bit of a rookie, but I have been through this process with the guys for a few months. And in essence, um, the WPCA does have uh, a fund that they accumulate over years. And the current balance in that fund is roughly $4 million. It's slightly at a high watermark right now due to the ups and downs of collections for sewer use fees. Typically, we would expect that fund under normal conditions to be in the 3.5 to 3.8 range once everything kind of flows through. All right. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> so bringing us to your question, I, I believe your question is of the of the $772,000, which represents 25% of the 3,088 of the project that's before us, how did the WPCA come to their, uh, their calculation? Well, in essence, there's really two projects that are tied together. There's this project and the other project on your agenda tonight, which are $5.5 .5 million, right? Um, and they're really linked together, and they both depend on the berm being built to protect the entire area. So the WPCA wanted to participate in this project as best they could, and we took, a, we took a global view of what might be fair, and the board as a general uh, took a vote on it. We looked at the, the, the numbers of buildings that are down there, because some are, some are WPCA buildings and some are not. Uh, we looked at the square footage of the wall, the berm, and the construction that would be built, uh, looked at the square footage of the uh, area itself, and even took a stab at looking about looking at what the value of the buildings might be. In the end, there really wasn't the metric that made sense. Um, it came down to a conversation about fairness and about what was right to do for the town and what was right to do for the WPCA so they could save some money in their reserve. And the conversation was certainly more art than it was science in the end. But based on all the criteria that we looked at, we came away, the board came away, by looking at a 50-50 split. So that takes the town's part down to the 386 and taking 386 out of the WPCA fund. So it wasn't any more scientific than that. Um, it was looked at in the global view of the town, the taxpayers, what was fair, what made sense, and what did not deplete the WPCA fund. Because as you probably know, there's a lot of other big projects coming through and coming through soon. So keeping a strong reserve made sense. Thank you. Um, but that, that is kind of where I'm going is there are projects coming through and I'm wondering how those might be divided up. And I, I think what you're saying, if I'm reading you, hearing you right, is that this, was, this is not just the WPCA project. This is that whole site, which that's is correct. a lot more than that. Yes. Um, and that's why it's a 50-50 share. And, and so that's it correct. wouldn't necessarily be that for a project down the road that was all for the wastewater plant. That's correct, and that's a very good point. I mean, the buildings include the fire training center, the, uh, the animal control center, there's other public works buildings, and of course there's the WPCA buildings themselves which are scattered about. So once again, there wasn't an exact scientific way of looking at it, but we knew that we had to find funding. We didn't want to saddle the taxpayers with the entire bill, and we wanted to be fair to the WPCA fund, and that's how the conversation evolved into a 50-50 split. Okay, thank you. Sure. Is that helpful? Yeah, thank you very sure. much. Are there any additional questions from the body? Seeing none, or is there anyone from the public who wishes to address this item? Certainly come forward, just introduce yourself for the record. I don't know if I qualify I as the so. public. I'm John Staffstrom from Pullman Comley. We're the bond council for the town. I'd just like to point out that the, uh, the matter as printed on the agenda is not correct. That the last amount oh. there, the last I resolve. It was the next one. Thank right. you. Further, that the bond re resolution appropriating 36162316 should be $3,088,000. Gotcha. The uh, 3088 is the total amount, it's the grant plus the match, and I'm, that must have gotten printed wrong because it's right in the resolution, it's wrong on the agenda. And that's my mistake. I, under, I understood it to be for item number 12. Um, 
so it's actually for this item, item number 11. Now, I think the resolution before you is correct. It's just not right on here. Gotcha. So I just need, can, I, can we just, would the body be okay with just taking a friendly amendment to adjust this to reflect? Okay. The 2316 is the amount of the grant. The 25% match is what we just talked about. It's an additional $772,000, half paid for by the town and half paid for the WPCA. And if you add those numbers together, the total amount that's asked for in the appropriation and the bond resolution, although you'll never use the, the grant part, is $3,088,000. Okay, so I have a friendly amendment from Representative Hurley, seconded by Representative Dean. Uh, all those in favor of just making this clerical correction, please signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Abstentions? <laughs> Thank you. So the item stands before us, just so you know, further resolved that a bond resolution appropriating $3,088,000 uh, for the costs associated with the wastewater treatment plant hardening be and hereby is approved. Um, is there any further discussion from the body? Any members of the public who wish to speak to this? Please step forward and state your name and address for the record. <laughs> Amy Mezoff. I just I have a question for um, Mr. Lesser. I was having trouble locating Part 6 of Chapter 130, which um, several of these resolutions mention that Fairfield is cognizant of the conditions and prerequisites, which is um, Part 6 of Chapter 130, Connecticut General Statutes. I couldn't locate that. Thank you. We don't, we don't take questions from the public. Thank you very much for your concern. We'll have some follow-up with you. We just take comment. Is there any further discussion from the body? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Seeing none, the item passes. Item number 12. To here consider and act upon the following resolution as recommended by the Board of Finance, whereas federal monies are available under the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Program administered by the State of Connecticut Department of Housing pursuant to Public Law 93-383 as amended, whereas pursuant to Chapter 127C and Part 6 of Chapter 130 of the Connecticut General Statutes, the Commissioner of Housing is authorized to disperse such federal monies to local municipalities and whereas it is desirable and in the public interest that the town of Fairfield accept from the state a grant in the sum not to exceed 2.5 million dollars in order to undertake a community development block grant disaster recovery trans 2 project water pollution control microgrid and to execute an assistance agreement therefore should one be offered now, therefore, be it resolved that the town of Fairfield is cognizant of the conditions and prerequisites for state assistance imposed by Part 6 of Chapter 130 of the Connecticut General Statutes and that the acceptance by the town of Fairfield of a disaster recovery community development block grant to be used for the water pollution control microgrid in the amount not to exceed $2.5 million is hereby approved and Further resolve that the first selectman is hereby authorized on behalf of the town of Fairfield to accept and expend said grant and further resolve that the first selectman is hereby authorized on behalf of the town of Fairfield to execute any and all necessary documents to secure said grant and further resolve that a bond resolution appropriating $2.5 million for the costs associated with the water pollution control microgrid be and hereby is approved. Moved by. Representative Dean, seconded by Representative Smay. Is there any discussion on this item? Representative Palmer. Joe, Joe Palmer, District 4. Um, Ms. Mezov is actually one of my uh, constituents, and I'm, um, she brought up a, a, a great point. I, I don't know if I have that. Um, or we have access to the, the backup information. Um, that outlines what part six of chapter 130 is. Um, so maybe as a follow-up to this, if the uh, town attorney can sure. uh, send that out through the moderator to, to us and we can get that out to um, members of the public. 
Thank you. Mr. Lesser, would you be able to send that? Part, part six of that uh, section is just the statutes that deal with community development. So I can get a, I can get you copies if you want to get your link. Yeah, I mean, you could maybe you you can even just point out where it is right there. We, a digital link would be great, but even just mentioning it now, where where it might be found. It's uh, hold on. It's entitled Community Development. It starts with Section 8-169A, and it goes through, I think, 8-169M or N. And this is where it grants these, these you know, me? this is where it refers to? Yeah, these are the sections that govern right. community development. Right, gotcha. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Any other further discussion from the body? Comments from the public? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Item passes. Item number 13. To hear, consider, and act upon the following resolution as recommended by the Board of Finance. Resolved that the Town of Fairfield purchase an undivided two-thirds interest in the property known as 908 Fairfield Beach Road, assessor's map number 184, lot 185 from the McKenzie Family Trust and James Y. Atkins for the sum of $268,000, as more particularly set forth in the real estate sales agreement between said parties and... Further resolve that the bond resolution entitled a resolution appropriating $200,000 for the costs associated with the acquisition of real property and authorizing the issuance of bonds to finance such appropriations be and hereby is approved. Moved by. Representative Mark, seconded by Representative Durrell. Is there any discussion on this item? Representative Braun. Catherine Braun, District 8. Um, there's a lot of discussion over whether we should bond this or pay for it out of some kind of surplus or contingency fund. Aside from that question, um, I, which I'll raise in a minute, I want to just point out that I'm very much in favor of this. I feel the Land Acquisition Commission as well as the Conservation Commission have both uh, endorsed it fully. They consider it a critical piece of property to allow access to our salt marsh. There's a huge area of salt marsh right behind this, which the town requires access to in order to provide many, many benefits to the town, such as flood control, marsh fire prevention, marsh restoration, mosquito control, flood water storage, and debris collection. And um, they consider this a very important parcel, so I, I'll take their word for it that it's a very important parcel. The question that I have is, would it be better not to bond it? Um, I know that by purchasing this, one of the justifications is it will re realize cost savings in terms of what the town does when they deal with the marsh. It will be easier to access it, therefore it will be you know, a little bit easier on the budget. However, I, I don't know um, if there is a chance we could bond it and how that would impact the negotiated uh, price and the, the deal that we struck with the uh, current owners of the, the one, th we own one, th we own one third, they own two thirds. Um, what would happen if we delayed it a little bit? And so through you, Madam Moderator, to uh, Attorney Lesser, if, if, if you could explain it, or maybe um, the first selectman, whoever's in the best uh, position to explain. Would either one of you gentlemen be able to address this? I know this was a question raised at committee if there were other options outside of bonding and then follow up on. Yeah, the question on delay, I would call upon Peter Penzer is here, who is the attorney who represents the other two owners. I don't know if he heard the question or not, but perhaps uh, he could come and comment on that. I also don't know how long it would delay it, maybe one month, if, if we sought to have the Board of Finance seek alternate financing in terms of paying out of our budget as opposed to uh, bonding to it. To the too, right? Yeah. Okay. You can. 
Uh, yeah, Peter A. Penzer. I live at uh, 657 Merwin. Uh, Peter A. Penzer uh, uh, is my name, and I live at 657 Merwin's Lane in Fairfield, and I represent the uh, two private owners who uh, have offered to sell the, uh, their interest in the property to the town. Uh, we made a, a proposal to the town that they uh, uh, that they uh, uh, buy the property, basically there are interest in the property, basically on an as is where is basis, and they um, from uh, people who are quite elderly uh, who would like to have the uh, and we've been <coughs> this has been kind of hanging around for a good year, uh, going through uh, discussions, uh, various committees, um, the. Uh, they would like to have it move right along. Um, what uh, what we would do if uh, if, uh, if 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 you didn't accept the offer as it is now and didn't proceed with it right now, I don't know, but uh, that's uh, would be for consideration afterwards. Yep. If I might just add on that, and with the question of timing. We're going into the summer months. Uh, as I understand it, there's an RTM meeting in July. There's not one in August. It couldn't get to the Board of Finance and back. Uh, not sure before your July meeting. Uh, based on what changed, it might also have to go back to the Board of Selectmen. Uh, and I don't think the Conservation Commission, but I think back through the Board of Selectmen based on exactly what changed on that. So that might mean it not, might not come back before this body uh, till September. Well, uh, you know, I think that we have uh, worked at this quite a long time. We would like to see it uh, move forward to closure so that the, uh, uh, if the people, basically the people are my age uh, and they like to enjoy a little bit of the proceeds that come from it, they've offered it on the basis of it being done as a fairly quick, as is, where is, quick. Uh, transaction, which uh, I think was fair enough. I think that the, uh, and uh, that's why the price is as the price is. So I think we should proceed, frankly. So my comment would be I'm against bonding, but I'm in favor of the project. So I'll have to make my mind up. Thank you. Yep, and I think you had some other questions around the bonding piece. If I can take it. what I asked, feel free to answer it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Two dogs and a burger? No. Uh, I, th I think the issue was uh, what are the options beyond that? And if, if you take a look, um, we have the options of if we're not going to bond it, we'd have to look for money in contingency. If it didn't come back before, uh, if, if it's not dealt with kind of at this meeting, uh, we'd be talking about next year's contingency. In the current fiscal 2015, I would be uncomfortable using kind of our balance and, and contingency there uh, because we're down to, I think, Mr. Mayor, we w when we went through the quarterly review, we finished with about, once we plused and minus our projections for year end, about $250,000 that we might end the year with in the black for fiscal 15. Okay, so that that's kind of where we sat with that, um, and I would be concerned going to fiscal 16, given the winter we just had, of using contingency up early in the year and not having it around for the winter and the snow plowing in case we needed it as we did this year. So uh, an ideal situation. I wouldn't disagree with philosophically. It'd be nicer to take something like that out of contingency. But as this body knows, for the last three years, we've tried to increase contingency. And that number has been reduced in each of the budgets that we've gone through, except for this most recent one. And, and not always by this body. I didn't mean that. It wasn't always by this body. The contingency that might be there now evaporates in about a week, right? Then we're talking about next year's budget. If we wanted to take this out of contingency as opposed to bond it, thank you. Yep. I think you were. Yeah, I think the the issue is we're not done with a year yet. Okay. So it's it's as we look at plusing and minusing different things. This is a very 
tenuous time. My point of making that the, the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar number out of a two hundred and eighty million dollar budget, we're looking at finishing two hundred and uh, fifty thousand dollars in the black at this point. Uh, there may be uh, we've had the snowplow issue. We've had some other cost issues on that side. We've been had some positive uh, revenue surprises, so that's been good. But so the timing, if we did bond it, if it came in in a couple of months, the con that the contingency we have now might not be there anymore. Is that what you're? Thank you. Okay. Representative Hurley. Michael Hurley, RTM, <coughs> excuse me, District 1. I have a little cold tonight, so excuse me. Um, I agree that it's a good piece of property for the town to acquire, and I would like to see it through, but I do have some, some reservations about us bonding it. Um, I did speak with the first selectman earlier today, and I expressed these concerns to him. I spoke with Tom Flynn as well, and I expressed some concerns. And they said that the, if we referred it back to the Board of Finance, they would be happy to take a look at all of the accounts, uh, year-end surplus, uh, contingency and such, and to see if there was a way uh, for it to be funded without bonding it. Secondly, I think there's a grant, not a, not a grant, money is coming from is the HF Trust Golf Con Smith Richardson, and they're contributing $75,000. I understand that they have $400,000 in the trust, and the minimum that they need to have in there is $30,000. So if there was some way in which they could contribute some more, I understand they would have to go back, I believe, to the Conservation Department to do that. Um, I, I, I think it's prudent. And if after taking sort of a, a real close look at it, you know, there's no other way to do this but to bond it, I think we, you know, consider going down that road. But I don't think everything has been exhausted to look into paying for this without using bonded dollars. Thank you. Representative Ambrose and then Representative Marks. Peter Ambrose, District 2, uh, through you, Madam Moderator, to, um, to Stanton Lesser. Uh, Stanton, a, re a review of the contract uh, indicates the closing date of September 15th of this year. Has the contract been signed? Attorney Lesser? Because I, my point is that if we live up to the closing date of September 15th, then we may have this additional time to inquire. I, I'm fully yeah. in favor of the acquisition. We probably have until that time. However, it's, the contract is also contingent on approval by all the boards. So whenever the approval takes place, <laughs> then we're obligated to sign, uh, to close. We're not obligated before that in any event. So, uh, But I think you heard from Attorney Penzer that his clients are elderly and they'd like to get this closed. And we told them that we'd push it as quick as we could. So I just ask that you bear that in mind. That's all. Thank you. I would just like to point out in terms of a maintenance thing, we do have a meeting in August. I was hopeful that we would be able to cancel that meeting um, as a summer recess, but if there is active business on the books, by all means this body can still meet. I have not yet canceled that meeting. That was just sort of what we were working towards. Thank you, Representative. Did you have fought more? Yep. Stanton, I, I don't think you answered my question. Has the contract been signed? I believe so. So the answer is yes. Attorney Lesser is commenting that the contract has been signed. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hurley. Michael Hurley, RTM District 1. Just the points of clarification. I'm usually pretty good with Robert's Rules of Order, but on this one I don't know the procedure. I believe I made a motion to refer it back to the Board of Finance for further consideration. Now, is it a live motion on the floor? And if so, doesn't it need to be seconded? No, you can make a motion to refer this back to the Board of Finance. 
I, I thought I did that. No, you didn't. I didn't? No. Okay, I will make a motion, excuse me, Michael Hurley, RTM, District 1, to refer this back to the Board of Finance for further consideration to see if it is appropriate to acquire this property without using bonded funds, and that may uh, involve uh, speaking to the H. F. Richardson. Smith Richardson. Smith Richardson Golf Commission, um, as well as looking at different uh, accounts in the town. How about all appropriate? All, all appropriate. All appropriate bodies. All appropriate bodies. Mr. Not to interfere with your motion, but it's the Conservation Commission that uh, controls the H. Smith Richardson Trust Fund. So that's all. I think it might. Okay. Thank you. Just in addition to what uh, Mr. Tetra just said, the, because money is going to come out of this trust that's deemed to be principal of the trust, it also requires the approval of the uh, Board of Finance, which they approved in their la at their last meeting when they approved this resolution. But it would have to go back to them. They would also have to approve the release of any money from the uh, trust, as actually as would the Board of Selectmen. So. Okay. I think if you just made the recommendation to send it back to all appropriate bodies. Okay, so just, just to conclude, uh, my motion was to send it back to all appropriate bodies for further review. Without bonding. Without bonding. Is there a okay. second? Seconded by Representative Palmer. Is there any discussion on this motion? Representative Garskoff, then Re Representative Dean. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Josh Garsoff, District 5. So I have a question about the timing. Given that motion, how would that affect that closing date? I'm not sure who to ask it to, but could we still make that closing date with this motion? Attorney Lesser. The September 1 closing date is an outside date. The closing date is 10 days after all approvals with, the, with an outside date of September 1. Could we make it? Yeah, probably. Uh, we could make it. But that's not really, we really were hoping to close sooner than that, and that's what the, maybe what the other party wants. Okay. You heard from, um, from Attorney Penzer. I think that was really the whole idea. That so they that's were, that's one of the reasons they came to the town instead of marketing it, they could, which they could have forced us to do. Put it on the market. They offered it to the town first. So the September date is really not the target. The target would be a, a much sooner date to, to close this deal. Yes. That would be the, the goal would be to close within 10 days after final approval. Which, which, is, which would be tonight if we voted for it. Yeah. So they, basically the, the idea would be to close within 10 days of tonight. Yes. Okay. I mean, technically we could wait the referendum period, right. I, I suppose. You know, but okay. other but within than that, a month. We, we would be setting up a closing if you approve it tonight. Okay. Thank you. Representative Dean. Representative Dean, District 4, uh, this body historically has bonded capital improvement plans and, and capital purchases. We've, we've been trying to move away from um, bonding, uh, well, we've moved away from bonding computers, we've moved away from bonding paving, and, uh, and we continue to chip away at our contingency. So I'm, I'm very concerned about that because um, there's an ordinance that's going to be coming before us in uh, weeks and months ahead with regards to snow removal, if you all remember, and, uh, and how much snow we had and how hard it was for the police department for just emergency vehicles to pass roads. I mean, we're considering an ordinance to ban street parking during snow storms because it just has been so heavy, and yet here we are looking at spending money in our savings uh, and, and throwing that by the wayside. Um, I'm really concerned about that. And also, the Board of Finance has looked at this, and they feel that it's appropriate and proper to bond for purchasing land. This is a good deal, and it's great for converse, uh, con conversation and conservation. And uh, I, I just can't support this amendment. Thank you. Representative Hurley, then Representative Marks. Michael Hurley, RTM District 1. Um, I don't believe there is a, an ordinance about uh, off-street parking. 
um, that's presented to this body now. Uh, secondly, in terms of the Board of Finance, I, I spoke to Tom Flynn. He wasn't at that meeting. He wasn't going to take a position on it outside of saying, you know, he'd like to see the numbers and if this body was to refer back to them and to look at other mechanisms beyond bonding, they would do their best to be helpful. Representative Markson, Representative Braun. Alan Marks. Alan Marks, District 6. Um, just to Representative Hurley's point about the Board of Finance, uh, in public, they approve this in a vote, and that's different than a private phone call. So I think what we have on record is the vote that was taken at the Board of Finance to approve $200,000 for bonding. Um, in terms of the money from the Smith Richardson, the, the uh, trust fund, um, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that that money is generally earmarked to add to the Smith Richardson property. Um, so I'm not sure it's appropriate. Maybe that's why they did not um, put in more money than the, than the amount they gave. Um, and lastly, just in terms of fairness, we have an elderly couple who has offered the town a really good deal. And as part of that deal, they wanted a quick approval. And that's what they're asking us to do. It's really good for the town, um, environmentally. $200,000, nobody likes to bond, but $200,000 is really not a lot compared to everything else we bond throughout the year. So I would ask you to vote against this amendment and let's pass this tonight. Kathy Braun, District 8. Um, I just note that former conservation director Tom Stanky is here in the audience and I asked him a few questions about this and it basically reaffirmed the need to get this critical piece of property primarily for flood control but all other reasons that the town would have to access the salt marsh and without having this access they have to get special permission from individual property owners I believe which isn't always necessarily easy or convenient or not all, might not be possible in all instances. So um, I think it's very important to get this. I'm leaning towards voting tonight, um, but I do have one follow-up question. I'm voting tonight in favor, even though it's bonding. It is real estate, and that, that, change, that tips, tips it a little bit in favor of it's okay to bond for real estate, maybe not for other types of things. I haven't made up my mind yet, but I do have a follow-up question for the town attorney, which is if we own one-third of the property, and the sellers own two-thirds, what happens if the sellers decide they don't want to wait and we go to all the boards and commissions and delay it a few months? I think it's a practical matter. If the sellers want to put the house th on the market, they really need our permission. There are ways to do it with a lawsuit. It would take a lot of time. They'd have to bring a partition action, actually, if we resisted. Uh, so I, as a practical matter, I mean, I think, you folks can can do what you want. I mean, you've already heard again, though, that this was supposed to be a quick sale, and uh, so I think again, take that into consideration, just to be fair to these people, who I think, as you already heard, it's it's a pretty good deal for the town. Thank you. Are there any further questions on the motion to send this back? Representative Hurley, Representative Dean, Representative Melaragno. Michael Hurley, RTM District 1, through you, Madam Moderator. Uh, I do believe we do have one of our financiers here, uh, David Becker of the Board of Finance. I was wondering if you could ask him if he could opine on referring this item back to the Board of Finance and looking at alternative measures of acquisition outside of bonding. Boy, I, I sit here at every meeting waiting to be called on. Thank you, Representative Hurley. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just just clarifying your question, where where where, where are you heading there? So, you want my take on this? Yeah, I mean, you, your your perspective. Yeah. Not as you're so, not speaking for the board. You're speaking as David Becker, a financier. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Um, so 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 on my end, I think you're, you're running you're running up against a tight budget at this point, and um, at, at the end of the year, we're used to. Um, from a revenue and an expense side, having pretty sizable surpluses, which we're not going to see this year. 
our last quarterly, I think, yeah, the number was somewhere around the 250 mark. And, and you know, obviously there's contingency, but a lot of that gets encumbered. So you're not going to take it out of this year. You're running up against the calendar then anyways. I think everybody knows that next year's budget is going to be on the tighter side. Um, you know, it, to begin with, it's approved. We haven't, you know, we started on July 1, but to tap out, you know, to p try and pull something out of contingency right at the beginning is not, um, A, I think it goes against what a contingency account is, is really for, um, and then B, immediately takes a hit on that account um, and avoids the buffer. So in my view, either you want to do it or you don't want to do it, and if you do, bonding is probably the path. I think you're, you're unlikely to get much more out of the trust fund, and if it comes before me, I'm not, I'll either say not to do it or to, or to bond it. I'm not a big fan of bonding. I think everybody, you know, it's, that my position on that's well known, but land is very different than um, the, uh, and the size of this is very different than the things that, at least in my case, I've advocated against bonding um, for. So this would, this would sort of fit. It's long term. It's not going anywhere. Um, we can we can pay for it. It's a small amount in reality. So I know I'm not helping your cause here um, at all. Um, and uh, I was uh, kind of being quiet that's about it. We, we that's all. We still appreciate your perspective, David. Great. Thank you. Representative Dean, still District 4. Uh, Representative Becker, good job. That was great. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to clarify that, um, correct, that the, I want to go back to the ordinance for the snow removal. That ordinance came before LNA, a body that I serve on. So it's correct. It's, it, it's expected to come back to LNA. The impetus for me using that example was the same, ex the same reason as I used when I got up the first time, and that is the heavy amounts of snow and the lack of removal of it and the unsafe passage on streets by our emergency vehicles along with our residents of Fairfield. So it did go through LNA, it was kicked out, and it's, with any luck at all, it'll come back to LNA for support. Thank you. Jeff Malaragno, District 8. Um, what was the timing of the original offer from the other parties to sell? Attorney Lesser. My recollection, and again, it's a little fuzzy, but uh, I believe that Attorney Penzer came to us maybe back in October of last year, thereabouts, and he had a map, and he said, you know, we own two thirds, you own one third, you either buy us out or we want to put the, put the property on the market. Um, and I think that Mr. Tetro said, why don't you get an appraisal? We had an appraisal done. And um, that probably, I want to say maybe in November, we got the appraisal and then we went back and forth a little, contracts were drawn and we just moved on from there. Okay, so it looks like about nine months total and we're seeing it at the end of that nine months. Uh, yeah, eight or nine months, I think it's okay. been so I, somewhere thereabouts. And I do um, feel for the other party involved. I, if I were them, I would want a quick sale as well. However, from our perspective, um, to be put in a situation where we have to make a decision at the last possible second, I think this is not the first time this has happened. And um, I don't appreciate us always being sort of the we need to get this done immediately type of uh, stamp of approval on things. Um, have there been any other groups approached for funding? I know that the, um, the Smith Richardson group um, has kicked in money. There are other conservation minded groups in town. Have any of the, uh, those groups been contacted to possibly get involved in the purchase of this land? Again, just to be clear, the Smith Richardson Trust Fund is not a group, but it is money controlled by the Conservation uh, Commission and potentially the Board of Finance has to approve that. Does the Board of Selectmen get involved in approving that also? Trustees. Board of Selectmen has to approve it. We're trustees. So it's not another group or organization from that standpoint. 
But it's there are other con conservation groups in town that fund private purchases of land that are then deeded to be open space, not purchased by the town, but purchased by private entities. Have any of those other groups in town been contacted to get involved in this negotiation so that the town wouldn't have to foot as much of the bill as currently stands? Yeah, not to my knowledge. When we brought it to the Conservation Commission, we were kind of hoping they'd pay for the whole thing. But since they didn't, then nobody else was contacted? It was just Correct. ended that at that was, point? Uh, we, we approached them in May. Okay, and then my last question, um, well, I guess I do have two questions. Are there any deed restrictions on this property? I know that that's not directly tied to the the amendment, but no, are there any deed You could hold stuff that's not relevant to the amendment, please. Okay. Thank you. I guess that's all I have then. Thanks. Thank you. Representative Hurley, then Representative Gottlieb. Michael Hurley, RTM District 1. I think this was a very good debate on the floor. Uh, coming in, um, I did not support uh, the bonding of this piece of property, but uh, after hearing the debate, hearing the comments from various ex officio members, including Mr. Becker, um, I will withdraw my amendment. Thank you. Who seconded the amendment? Uh, Representative Palmer, is that acceptable? Okay, the motion's with the body. So the motion's been withdrawn. We're back to the main motion. Representative Melaragno, did you have a question about deed restrictions? Jeff Melaragno, District 8. Um, so are there any deed restrictions on this land? Do you mean are there going to be any deed Correct. restrictions? No, they're going to deed the property of the town and under our ordinances, the property will be designated as open space. It will be under the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. So they will basically be able to do what they want with it. Okay. Uh, and then my last question. Uh, do you know the, um, I guess this might be for Mr. Mayor, do you know what the approximate amount of the total um, purchase will be once principal and interest is included with the bonding? Okay, thank you. The answer was no. Is there anybody else from the body who wishes to speak to this issue? Seeing none, is there anyone from the public who wishes to address this item? Back to the body. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Representative Melaragno, Representative McCullough, Representative Meyer. Abstentions? Representative Jones. Item carries. Item number 14, under Rule 32 of the RTM Rules to Regulate Amendments to Chapter 99 of the Town Code, Transi Emergence, sponsored by Michael Hurley, District 1, Joe Palmer, District 4, and Pamela Icono, District 9, have been referred by the moderator to the Legislation and Administration Committee. Um, I sit on that committee and I can inform you that that item has been held over um, for further review. Back to items that presenters were not present, present here. Um, Penfield Building Committee, Mr. Mayor, we have a question regarding the FEMA reimbursement process and where we stand to date. Would you be able to address the body regarding the Penfield Building Committee project? Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. Um, just uh, a little bit of background is redundant for many of you, but maybe to make sure everybody's on the same page. Uh, storm happened October 12, 2012. About a month ago, we got the uh, $924,000 check relating to the public safety expenditures that were expended uh, during the period. Uh, the check from FEMA. So FEMA is, uh, and those are pretty specific, well-documented uh, expenditures. Uh, so as you can just, uh, give that as an example of FEMA takes a while to get things done. Um, as you all know, the board, the boards of the town passed a $6 million, $6 million, $20,000 appropriation to uh, repair the facility to its original condition 
uh, with improved uh, mitigation and flood mitigation controls, elevations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, since as FEMA continued to respond uh, less expeditiously than we liked, uh, Mr. Tetro uh, contacted the uh, congressional delegations, federal and state, and when that happened, uh, things have started to move more rapidly through the process. I'm on the phone with FEMA and the various congressional delegations uh, a couple of times every week. We have conference calls with them, with FEMA. There's a lot of activity going on. Uh, I'd like to compliment uh, Congressman Himes' office, who has taken uh, the lead, a lady from her, from his office, uh, Amy Lapos, has taken the lead. Um, the latest on this is uh, what they ended up doing. We agreed that what FEMA did was they hired an outside expert. Since we couldn't agree, since I say we, since uh, they were not ready to pass on our submittal uh, for the, the cost structure, uh, and so they had we had a meeting, sit down meeting. They hired an outside contractor, Dewberry Associates, international firm, quite respected, uh, similar to the Wood O'Brien firm that we are using as our consultant. Uh, Wood O'Brien and Dewberry got together. Uh, they completed a calculation. That calculation uh, was within uh, percentages of decimal points. Of, of they, can, they can calculate that jointly. That joint calculation was within percentages of uh, percentage points of the calculation that the town originally submitted. So that's the good news. Um, they um, are, have now taken that calculation, they being FEMA, and they actually had an internal call today that we were not invited to join. Um, and they are going through a matrix of issues that they had that they want to resolve uh, to use the uh, program manager's um, terms said so we want to button it up and make sure it's bulletproof. That's quote unquote. Um, anticipate within the next week or two, we will get some kind of specific um, comment from them as to what they accept and, and what they don't accept and, and what the, the scope might be. Now, if you remember when this came up, uh, originally when there was some question that FEMA had uh, turned down our application, uh, and I, I think I submitted a letter to Board of Selectmen, maybe this body, I don't remember. Uh, there's a couple of issues here. One, it's everybody agrees and seems to be on the same page that the facility was destroyed in the, in the storm, that it needs to be repaired, that it needs to be brought up to codes, code standards. Uh, through mitigation, additional mitigation uh, construction. Um, what seems to be a little bit at issue is the path to go there. And FEMA has a multiplicity of, of uh, policies and procedures and, and ways to go. Um, and they, they perform calculated, uh, they, they use software called Iris Means to to calculate replacement numbers, repair numbers, repair and replace numbers, various different numbers. Uh, they have a CEF formula, uh, cost estimate format that they go through. And, and the, what our, con our consultants believe, uh, and continue to believe, is that my phone is ringing. No, it's actually a, uh, <laughs> that would be nice. Uh, <laughs> Actually, a member of one of the other town bodies. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the watching on TV, right? <laughs> You're wrong, Mayor. That's not. It's not what you said last time. No. Uh, but uh, that we'll get to the same place, but um, how we get there is at this point has not been determined or decided. Uh, so that's the long answer. The short answer is uh, I anticipate, based upon all the conversations with all the bodies, Wood O'Brien's, Dewberry's, 
FEMA, the congressional offices, that uh, we will have some specific information uh, within the next couple of weeks, after which we'll sit down and have a, a work session, which will then be defining the mitigation costs, the scope of the project, the soft costs, and uh, the best way to uh, proceed to uh, realize the objective, which is to get the Penfield Pavilion uh, open and running. Thank you very much for the FEMA update. Are there any questions for Mr. Mayor just on the FEMA piece? Representative Caffarelli. Hi, uh, Brian Caffarelli, District 10. Um, through you, Madam Moderator, to Mr. Mayor. I, that was kind of a long answer, and I know that you, uh, you said as much, but um, I'm a little confused as to the timeline. Are, are you with me? Yes, I'm confused with the timeline. Okay. I, you're texting, so I didn't know if you were listening to me. <laughs> okay. Um, as to when we first became aware that this could be a problem and actually when the congressional delegation was contacted. The um, working with FEMA has been, a, has been an issue since the, the initial uh, submittals for uh, all the various reimbursable expenditures uh, were submitted um, because everything seems to take a great amount of time. They come, continue to come back for more information, additional information, even though we believe the initial information was clear. Uh, the uh, two plus million dollars that we have collected, uh, we've pretty much gotten uh, 99 point X percent of our submittals. They've turned out to be accurate and correct, but it's taken a while. Um, as the project, as this project was moving forward, as the town was making its decision and we're ready to uh, put the spade in the ground, I, th I think it became, uh, from my perspective anyway, as a CFO, became imperative that we realize fully and comprehensively what FEMA was going to do before we put the spade in the ground. And uh, that was why we uh, accelerated the process th through the uh, discussions with the congressional delegations. And I think we approached them February, March. Mr. First Selectman, do you remember exactly? That was actually the second time. We, we initially approached them last fall in an October, November time frame. Uh, we had a conference call. Uh, in our offices here, uh, but the impact of the congressional delegation and the f their involvement kind of weighs off with mm -hmm. FEMA, so we had to bring them back in. Right, and that was we got we got a boost when they first got involved, then they kind of slowed down. We we needed a second boost, and they got a you know, real hands-on approach. Again, as you mentioned, Congressman Heim's office, Senator Murphy's office, and Senator Blumenthal's office, all three got involved to help put some pressure on FEMA, just to get FEMA moving forward. Uh, once they decided to bring in an outside resource, because they're, they're divided into groups, segments around the country, and the, the, up in the Northeast, we don't get as many hurricanes. They're not as familiar with how some of the rules and guidelines work. But after they decided to bring in somebody from the outside, it took them another month to bring that person on, on staff. So that, that uh, as Bob pointed out with some examples of both the debris cleanup, it took, you know, literally years to get the money back and that's a pretty straightforward process that's just going out picking stuff up and, and submitting the project worksheets the PWs to uh, get things back so uh, the the federal delegation has been superb uh, in terms of helping out but the answer but to the question was when we contacted them this last time was with, it was in March or April I don't remember this that. last time uh, I believe March yeah so yeah the, the first time was to get some clarification uh, there was some information that FEMA had made uh, a decision, et cetera, et cetera, which uh, turned out obviously not to be true. But uh, that, uh, but since March, uh, in the sit-down meeting, and then it's, as Mike, as Mr. Tetro just pointed out, 
It took a month for them to engage Dewberry. Since Dewberry has been engaged, uh, things have been progressing, and there's like weekly conference calls. A concern that I'm having is that I, I can't, after sitting through a lot of these meetings and reading what's emailed to me, when I'm asked by my constituents in the beach area, I can't give them a solid answer. And there was information presented to us that I relied upon to make this P Penfield vote. And <laughs> I'm, not even, I'm not even getting a clear answer from tonight where we are in terms of this moving target and what's happening with FEMA. And maybe it's because, I mean, maybe it's rectified by putting a representative from the RTM on these FEMA calls or having some type of better communication because I personally am not feeling it. And I don't want to have September, October come and say, oh, well, you know, we, FEMA made another miscalculation or we weren't aware of that or maybe we needed to do something else and, and we're not going to get it now. So it seems to be a moving target. And I, d I don't know what the answer is, but... I think there needs to be a little better communication, and I just don't know what to tell constituents saying, <coughs> well, what, what are we really on the hook for? I mean, my vote was based on the fact that we were on the hook for under a million dollars, whatever that would be, based on the FEMA reimbursement and the insurance reimbursement. But, but then I'm hearing other, other stories that we're not if we don't hit that 50% mark, and now we're calling out the cavalry because something happened, and I don't know if that's been brewing for a while. I mean, I, I have personal experience in dealing with FEMA. Back in 2012, same thing happened to us at the beach, but ours is done and resolved, so I, don't, I just don't understand. So if you could succinctly tell me <coughs> what to tell my neighbors. Well, there's nothing that happened. We, we didn't pull out the cavalry because something happened. We pulled it out because FEMA was being FEMA and taking their time. Um, at one of these meetings, one of the RTM members said, hey, if New Jersey can build the boardwalk right away, why can't we build Penfield? I'm not saying that. I, I know you know, I'm just using that as an example. And the reason was New Jersey was committed to building the boardwalk. They didn't care what the reimbursement was. If you look at FEMA New Jersey right now, they're just now getting the documentation out to the homeowners to, to, uh, to put in the claims for the damages to the homes. So, dealing with FEMA is just not uh, something that happens quickly. Um, and there's always been, and every time that we've presented, uh, when I say we, the administration or myself, the Department of Finance, uh, whenever we presented to the Board of Selectmen, to the Board of Finance, uh, to this body, it's always been very clear, try to be very clear, that we are basing our assumptions based upon the policies of FEMA, the reimbursement policies, the written policies and regulations, and the best estimates of uh, our consultants with O'Brien's, who are international, uh, Lee in scope, international in scope, and are well regarded, and do a lot of FEMA work, Katrina, uh, a lot of, you know, Texas, every time there's a storm down there. Uh, the firm that FEMA hired to, to come in, Dewberry, also international in scope, also uh, highly regarded. Um, so the, the focus here is, and I understand your issue, and that's why we are trying to aggressively pursue getting a resolution, is that the bodies did vote given a certain set of assumptions and that have the town uh, having a net out of pocket of uh, somewhere around a million dollars. And uh, we certainly would like to know exactly what that number is, at least I would, before we put a spade in the ground. And we, we want to clarify that, get final notice on that. Um, and that's, that's what the effort is. Um, well, thank you. I appreciate your response. Um, I just wish that it could have been bulletproof a long time ago. Thanks. Representative Dean, then Representative Palmer. Representative Dean, District 4. Um, point of order, Madam Moderator, I have a question for you with regards to Robert Rules. When a new speaker comes up to the floor and they need to address another party, are we to ask permission through you to discuss, to address that party? Yes. Okay. So I, um, while 
through you to the body. Uh, while I, uh, I'm certain that, rep that uh, Mr. Mayor could certainly defend himself quite appropriately, I feel compelled to ask you to address the body that whenever, um, that it's not appropriate to purposely, for any member to purposely try to embarrass anyone else uh, from this floor. And it, given our closeness to our election, it's very tempting to do that. And I ask that we all be respectful and mindful for any speaker who comes before us to, to address us or who may be in the audience. Thank you. Duly noted. However, I did observe that as a follow-up and not a call-out. But thank you for raising that issue. Representative Palmer. Joe Palmer, District 4. Um, I think uh, during the committee meetings, at least uh, I experienced a, a great update from Mr. Bradley, the, the chair of the Penfield Building Committee. I think we have a, a good understanding that uh, next year, around this time, hopefully a little sooner, early June, um, Penfield is going to be restored and, um, uh, and open. And I think that's a, a great development that everyone needs to know that, that um, late August or sometime in August, um, ground will be broken there. Um, people will be able to see some progress. There'll be some demolition, et cetera. So that's one update. I think on the other side of it, the financial side, um, I think it would be important, um, you know, just to give feedback to Mr. Mayor. Um, I think when we went through the approval process for this bonding resolution, um, there was a, a really nice outline, a financial outline of kind of where the money was, was coming from. And I think one thing that might be helpful is to just maybe get an update of that document, where we are, what additional funds came in, how we're tracking against it. I don't know if it's, you know, really the, you know, the same format, but I think that might be, I mean, I'm not speaking for um, Representative Caffarelli, but I think that might be some of the frustration, maybe just some, um, indication of kind of where we are versus you know the point when we approve the resolution and you know how we're tracking against those and I, and I understand that there is a narrative that that you know we're, we're going through here where we're having trouble with FEMA and everything but um, kind of again some indication of how we're chipping away at um, the figure to get us down to um, you know what we all assumed when we approved this I think that would be important and you don't have to comment on it, but you can if you want. Thank you. No, actually, just Ms. Palmer, was that excellent comments. And it actually made me realize it could have had a very short answer to the original question. Uh, the numbers are the same as they were the last time I appeared before the body. There's, there's been no changes in the numbers. I think the only difference is um, the, you know, when we get down to the nitty gritty, um, you know, Will Bryan. Uh, our consultants, who we've depended on a lot in, in this process, put together uh, the information with the engineers, with the architects, as to what was necessary to bring the building uh, up to codes and standards, uh, new codes and standards subs uh, issued subsequent to the storm and subsequent to when the building was originally constructed. And the, um, if there are any issues that come up, that need to be addressed, it would probably be uh, maybe differences between the Witt O'Brien um, codes and standards uh, recommendations and advice and uh, what they believe FEMA should be approving uh, based upon the FEMA policy and regulations and what uh, you know, FEMA might question. And as Mr. Tetra pointed out, uh, the Region 1 FEMA and they're, they're pretty autonomous. It's a federalist system. Uh, the, the various FEMA regions uh, are pretty autonomous. And as Mr. Tetra pointed out, this region um, has not had a significant amount of experience with uh, hurricanes and some storms of this magnitude, which is why they deemed it necessary to properly evaluate the project to bring in the consultant from Dewberry. Thank you. And, um that, that there hasn't been any change in terms of us receiving any funds since we approved it. That, I think, is, you know, that's an important type of update. And I, I, I just uh, recommend that, you know, I, I think over time, 
these questions are going to continue to persist. And if we can be looped in and updated as, as funds come in and how that goes against the plan, you know, maybe there's some document that could be created around it that could keep us all up to date. And again, because we are getting these questions. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I actually have a follow-up question for you, if you don't mind. F forgive me, and maybe my memory is not serving me correctly, and forgive me for asking you to break this down into just a little bit simpler terms. When we voted on the appropriation, was there an assumption that we met the 50% threshold for reimbursement? Yes. Has anything changed, and have we been notified that we do not meet the 50 percent threshold for reimbursement? Um, we have not been notified that we have not. The only thing that has changed is that the uh, Whit O'Brien uh, 50 percent rule consultant guru sat down in a room in uh, somewhere in Louisiana for three days together with uh, Joseph Klein, the Dewberry consultant, and uh, it's my understanding, based upon the information I've received both from Wynn O'Brien's and from the congressional consultants, that, that we did indeed pass the 50 percent rule at the approximately within de uh, percentages of def decimals of decimal points, I guess, of our original calculation. Okay, so FEMA is saying that we do meet the 50 percent Well, threshold. FEMA hasn't said anything yet. Oh. Dewberry and Whit O'Brien worked the numbers together, and that came out that way. Uh, then those have been submitted to FEMA. FEMA is now reviewing them, and that was, and they have a matrix of issues that they wanted to discuss. That was the conference call that they held today that we were not invited to attend. Okay, and forgive me, but was it FEMA who told us when we voted on the appropriation that we met the 50% rule, or it was these consultants? It was the consultants and, okay. and, our, and our work. In the All right, so the consultants have consistently told us that we meet the 50%. We have never heard, even to date, whether or not FEMA ha agrees that we meet the 50%. No, but we have heard that FEMA's consultant thinks we do. Okay. Thank you very much for that clarification. There are any other questions from members of the body on the FEMA reimbursement for Penfield? Seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Again, Mr. Bradley, thank you to your commit you and your committee for your work on this project, and we all look forward to this hopefully opening next summer. Um, the next item on the agenda is to hear an update from the Osborne Hill Building Committee Chairman or her designee regarding the status of the Osborne Hill Building Project. I see that Ms. Marshall has arrived. If you would mind coming up and just giving the body a briefing on where you stand with the project. Hi, can everybody hear me? Um, I assume that you have received um, my written update. Um, the body received your update this afternoon. I'm okay. not sure how many people were able to read it right before they came here, so you might want to hit the highlights of your report. Okay, thank you. Um, right now, uh, we're in the third phase of our uh, project. The first phase was windows and doors at one end of the school. The uh, second phase was the gymnasium. And the third phase is, uh, is the windows and doors for the balance of the school. Uh, that renovation, the third phase work started right after school got out uh, last oh, week. Sorry. Okay. Uh, the third phase started right after school got out last week. Um, right now, the project is at approximately 80% complete. And without, um, we, we don't anticipate any other delays, and uh, we expect to be done in about just less than two months from now. Uh, we've got punch list work going on in the first two phases, um, and uh, as most of you probably know, the gymnasium finally opened up a couple of weeks ago uh, towards the end of the school year. 
Uh, the delays for the gym were the result of a number of different factors, but uh, they've all been resolved. Uh, we are now past the part of the renovation where all the, um, the greatest likelihood of uh, encountering unknown conditions is passed. Uh, we, um, the um, members of the construction team, including the architect, the general contractor, the head of school facilities, the clerk that works, the um, uh, various trade contractors, and I meet weekly to monitor the project, and the committee meets monthly, uh, and will continue to do so until the project's complete. Um, Joe Palmer from the RTM has uh, recently joined our committee as a representative of the RTM. Uh, last winter, we had requested uh, additional funds for um, a contingency. Uh, we, uh, at your request, um, uh, had our architect uh, uh, draw up uh, plans and specs to, um, uh, for a proposed walkway, uh, anticipating a budget of $120,000. Uh, the general contractor we had on the project uh, had bid uh, $413,000 last year. Uh, it was um, something we had to consider as an alternate uh, pending the outcome of our project. Uh, and his project, or his uh, price was no longer um, valid and available to us by this past winter. When we put the um, uh, walkway project out for bid this spring. Uh, we unfortunately only got one um, one proposal, and it was uh, an outrageously high proposal. Uh, I I would imagine that the contractor felt he was the only bidder on the project, which is exactly what happened. Um, so at this at this point, um, we are not going to pursue the walkway project because um, there, it wouldn't be right to spend that kind of money on the walkway and we, we don't have it left in our contingency. At this point we have about $241,000 out of the $340,000 we had uh, requested and received um, and by, the, by probably the middle of September we'll have a pretty good handle on the exact uh, final figure for that. Uh, if you want to pursue the walkway project, what we'd probably have to do is put it out for bid at a better time of the year so that we can get the most competitive prices. Um, trying to bid something out in April or May resulted in um, some very, um, very low interest and very high prices. We might be able to get something for the budget that the RTM suggested uh, last February. Uh, we could give it a try, but um, at this point we have around two hundred and forty thousand dollars left in our um, in our budget. Thank you. Are there any questions for Ms. Marshall? Uh, Representative McCullough. Thank you for that report. Mary McCullough, District 3. Um, I don't know who this question should be addressed to, uh, Madam Moderator, but to you, um, where has the intention of this body gone wrong. This body voted to fund this walkway. And it came up in discussion more than two years ago. So where's the failure to get this project done? Ms. Marshall, do you want to try and answer? Or I know you report to the first selectman. I don't know. Well, um, because uh, the budgets were done several years ago, and um, we thought that when we, um, uh, because of rising construction prices, 
we thought that it would be best to keep the walkway as an alternate when we um, developed the uh, construction documents and when we put the project out for bid. And uh, the uh, bid results that we had gotten for uh, the project when we bid it last year uh, meant that the walkway uh, as designed uh, simply was not affordable within our budget. So um, we, we weren't able to proceed with it. And um, it, you know, it, we had granted um, a, 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 a really nice walkway between the building and the annex, uh, but we have to we have to consider what the um, you know overall broad budget was, and uh, we just weren't able to do it uh, within um, what we had allocated to our project. Um, um, through you, Madam Moderator, to the first selectman, um, can you um, update this body as to how many times the Osborne Hill Building Project has reported to the first? Selectman to the Selectman's uh, committee, please, on their updates. And it, for the purpose of, you know our, we're on, our intentions were to make sure this walkway took place. So at what point were you aware, or the Board of Selectmen aware, that this was not um, going to happen? One, I can't give you off the top of my head how many times, but uh, Ms. Marshall and her, representing her committee have come before the Board of Selectmen a number of times on updates. I think w we realized it, um, and forgive me, I'd have to go back and, and review the minutes to pick a date, but the number that comes to my mind is when it came back before us uh, as potentially a $500,000 expenditure, which was beyond, I think, anything that this body was contemplating at the time. I think this bid, uh, came back. This body reinforced they really wanted to see the walkway. Uh, the committee went back and said, okay, let's get the architect to put together the specs. Let's get it out to bid. And if I understand it correctly, the walkway came back closer to $700,000 this time. All right. So the time and as I understand it, the next step was to wait till the winter till a slower period and perhaps go back and, and consider doing a rebid on that and getting that back. Either way, as Ms. Marshall pointed out, to do some, to put that walkway and get that completed would take some additional funding over and above what they have. So that would bring it definitely back to all the boards, including this body. I just can't say for the members of this body and for the members of the term from the last body how disappointed I am that our intentions to keep the children safe at Osborne Hill School have not been met. I think that's everybody's intention. And the issue is one of cost, not one of safety. All right. For that, um, if the committee goes back out to bid on that, that's something that would come back before this board uh, to allow that to happen. But it was not a question of trading off safety. It was a question of not having money in the budget. And they're not allowed uh, by their charge to go over that number. Ms. Marshall, just as a, on a follow-up to that, the $700,000, is that for the full-on walkway that you guys had originally proposed, or is that for the modified alternate that the RTM was backing? Well, unfortunately, um, the difference with the sole bidder between the high end and the low end was around, I believe, ten thousand dollars, which was even uh, more outrageous than the um, price for the full loan walkway. And in, it was a competitive bid. Unfortunately, it was the only bid, and that's the way the marketplace is at this point. And due to state reimbursement rules, you must put it out to bid the way that it was originally bid? That's the way I understand it, that in order uh, to be under the same project number, it has to be um, put out um, 
to um, Sal. Actually, that might be a question you could answer. Okay. Um, Mr. Morabito, if you could address how the bidding works, because my I'm I'm not understanding why we had to put out the bid for a full-on enclosed hallway when all we were seeking was an enclosed walkway. I, uh, I understand. I can address that. So. Sal Morbido, uh, Manager of Construction for the Board of Ed. Uh, with OSF, the Office of School Facilities, we have, we have certain rules that we have to follow. We can bid the drawings that were approved by the state. We can put on alternates to that. We can put um, modifications on that as an alternate to the original bid. It's kind of a long way to get to where we wanted to go, but we did have to bid the original alternate, which was what you're calling the full-on, full hallway uh, or larger hallway. We had to bid that with an alternate package for the modified, uh, more modest $120,000, $150,000 uh, estimated project. So we would be receiving two numbers. The two numbers that, as Ms. Marshall said, were very close together and it was extremely high, uh, basically with the hope that they were the only man standing and we had to do it at that moment. It's a, a, a method of operation I don't agree with, but um, that's what we ended up with. It was a tight time frame. Um, it's a smaller standalone project, so it didn't uh, garner the interest that we would have hoped to get multiple bids and actually better bids. Thank you for that clarification. Um, Representative Ference, would you take over for a moment because I'd like to speak to this issue as a member of the body. Representative Iacono, District 9. I was a member of the original Annex Building Committee, the Special Project Standing Building Committee. And I think I share the same sentiment as Representative McCullough and many other representatives in this room about how gravely disappointed I am that this project got caught up in government bureaucracy and we are not getting an enclosed walkway. I don't mean to criticize citizen volunteers. I've been one. I am one in many other organizations. But somewhere, somehow, somebody should have taken a leadership position on this. And when the building came forward, building committee came forward to the Board of Selectmen with a full-on hallway, which was never the intent of anyone, and I can speak to that because I used to be on the Board of Education. That's what we call scope creep. And a good manager would go back and say, nope, that's not what we were looking for. Go back and make this a simple walkway readdress your drawings and send those up to the state. And then maybe we would have a walkway that was enclosed today that was simple, plain, but protective for children. But no, nobody caught the soap scope creep, nobody sent it back, and nobody asked for it to be redone. And that really, really, really upsets me. For kids, for kids, for 500 children who have been in a portable gym, a contaminated school building with windows that have PCBs for I can't tell you how many years. This isn't political. This isn't a going after anyone. This is just upsetting to me as a parent, as a former member of the Board of Education, as a representative town meeting member, and for a bunch of children who are sick of seeing construction people in their building who should be able to walk from one place to another and not have what we wanted for them because government dropped the ball. I'm upset. I think that's clear. And I hope that somehow, someone, somewhere can take a leadership role on this and figure out a way to get that walkway enclosed the way it was intended when that annex was put on years ago. Thank you. Representative Palmer.
Joe Palmer District 4. Um, I, this, this project is, has lasted, this is, I think it's in its uh, third going on fourth year. Um, and I think we're, there are some things that are uh, being discussed here that are getting confused. Um, the, the, the project, I, I think the building committee, personally, I think the building committee did the responsible thing in, in, in doing all the, they ran out of money, actually, with the existing expenses for the project. They came back to us for a contingency amount. We actually were going to increase the amount um, or had the intention of increasing that amount through this body and then we weren't able to but then we went back and, and we had heard at some point that there was an, in, an incremental $250,000 in the budget which didn't materialize and, and I, I want some clarification on that but I think there is good news we didn't spend the contingency amount we have about 200 I think $240,000 left in this budget um, that could be applied towards the walkway. So I think the money is there. I, I've been hearing that we didn't have the money for it, but I, I think it is there. But what I also think, and, and I, don't, I don't believe it actually, the, the way the process works, and you know, not to um, disagree uh, for a second, but I, I actually think um, right now, the way the building committee is working, they don't have that direction of are we, are we spending the whole $240,000? Are, um, are we limited to the $120,000 that we had you know, made a motion about? Um, so I do think there needs to kind of be a discussion around taking this next step. Okay, the, the windows are almost done. So you know, again, we're 80% 80, 80 there. Uh, windows will be done this summer. The only thing that's left is the, is the enclosure. And unfortunately, the building committee even has to stick around until we get that enclosure done. So they're going to have, you know, it's, they're going to be in their four and a half year. So I think what needs to happen is whether it's a meeting at the board of selectmen level, um, d a discussion at maybe each, each of the bodies. I don't know what the mechanism of government is, but I think it needs to be reevaluated. And I think the building committee needs to be given specific direction on what we want the enclosure to be, where that, that spending limit's going to be, et cetera. But, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, that, that $240,000, I don't know if, if that's what everyone believes is, you know, this enclosure is going to be able to cost, or we're approving that it'll cost. Um, so, but uh, to the first, through you, Ms. Mo Madam Moderator, to the first selectman, um, just going back to the $250,000 that we thought was available and we talked about in that meeting, um, that, that, was a, in, that was an incorrect statement. Just we, we thought that there was an accounting error that freed up $250,000. And I'm just hoping you can clarify that. That's just one, one thing that I think needs to kind of be kind of put behind us to figure out where we are here. Okay. I believe Ms. Marshall is in the best position to answer that question. We had um, between the uh, uh, town, um, our records for the project, uh, which were handled by our clerk of the works, and uh, the town accounting uh, procedure uh, or process. Um, we had a difference in terms of encumbrances, and uh, this became apparent at the when we got the re got information a few months after the fiscal year ended. So we thought that there we were about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars off. And as it turned out, um, it was simply um, a terminology um, differential, and we weren't short that kind of money. So when we did go uh, looking for the contingency amount of 340, that's um, what we actually did need. Thank 
you. So, you know, I, I don't know um, if, uh, first of all, if you want to comment on kind of, you know, what you envision as a path forward here. Again, we have uh, the contingency of $240,000 left. Um, we had talked about designs that were around $150,000. The RTM then made a proposal that we, th you know, our intention might have been to approve $120,000, but we want this enclosure. Um, how can we ensure that the building committee has the right direction on what their boundaries and parameters are, and in a way that, you know, gets the, what every body wants done done? Yeah. Simply put, at this point. Each of the bids that have come back, both the initial four hundred and fifty or five hundred thousand dollar number and seven hundred thousand dollar number, are all much over the the one fifty number that you're talking about. So we don't have any plan that supports the one fifty number, as best I can tell. However, the uh, when did the seven hundred thousand dollar number come back? Uh, that was uh, that was a couple of weeks ago, and okay, it's if we had. Um, it's it's not worth that kind of money. Um, it's probably worth close to what the budget of uh, say one hundred and fifty thousand dollars is, but um, we can't. I mean, we have to. We're having people bid in the open marketplace, and if they're going to bid seven hundred thousand dollars, and they're the only bidder, that's the only bid that we've got to consider. Yeah. Now, thank you. My, my point was that the $700,000 number just came back two weeks ago. So this is the first update coming part of that. So, Mr. Palmer, to your point, which I think is well taken, and that they will come back, take, come back to the Board of Selectmen, update us to where they are, and also identify how much of that $240,000 is still needed to finish the project where it is. This is the land of PCBs. They have dealt with one PCB issue after another. In terms of going through this, include everything from the, well, I won't repeat it all. You've all heard it in, in various updates going through. That's the challenge. Uh, once you get step into PCBs, it's like quicksand, and you're not quite sure what the mitigation, what else is going to take place. So the committee will be coming back, will be giving us an update as to where they stand. All right. But if the walkway is going to cost $500,000, one of the first questions, I think, is why does it cost that much? But it seems to have consistently caught that much. And I think you did a cut down version in your seven hundred thousand dollar bid, and it still came in it still came in pretty high. It was about ten thousand yeah. dollars difference. And so, really that right. that was just the marketplace problem. So as much as the hundred and fifty thousand dollar number is in our consciousness, there is absolutely no support or construction work or detailed design that shows that something that uh, at that cost point can be built. So that will be one of the questions going back to the building committee is what can we do to get that down into something that would provide the safety uh, but not have that. But the 700,000 is late breaking news from that standpoint. They just got those numbers back. So they need to evaluate that. What drove that cost? What is it about this that seems to be driving that from conceptually, and we get in trouble with conceptual estimates both on individual walkways as well as entire school projects. What drove that from that kind of estimate up to the 500,000 or higher number, and can we tweak that, modify that, and get back out uh, with that to do? All right. But the project itself, the f first and foremost part of the project, is to develop a school building that is safe for our kids to inhabit every day. And if you remember, that was what got us there. That was air quality. That was PCBs and all sorts of services. That's what they've been wrestling with. They wrestled with a gym and having that take longer to fix. And they, that chewed up some of the money, I believe, Ms. Marshall, you've mentioned that in prior updates. That was the vast majority of uh, what we went into for contingency. Okay. So that's been the challenge. So we can come back um, and revisit the walkway once we have a stable project and where we are and we know that the school that's safe is safe and healthy for our kids to be in. That was the primary goal. Right? The walkway, fortunately, is something we can add on. And if perchance it's the original spec that's doing that, one of the points we talk about, so we don't want to take a $150 project 
And for those of you who are around with Ward Roof, you heard this before, we don't want to spend, take a $150 project and spend $500,000 so we can get a reimbursement at 25%. That makes no sense. So the question becomes, if we go off reimbursement spec, what can we do for less? Because if it's going to cost that much to get reimbursed, can we build it for less? For those of you that weren't around for Ward Roof, there were some specs that we had. We would have had to spend an additional $2 million on Ward Roof in order to get an additional million dollars back in reimbursement. It made no sense. All right. We found a way around it then, and potentially we can find a way around this one, too. Thank you. And that, that's helpful. Um, and, you know, we do have time now. Um, it appears that this is the worst time to be bidding. Um, so hopefully these, con these conversations can happen so they have the proper direction on, on you know, all those questions are asked, like you said. Um, I do want to also just, just remind um, everyone that there was a certain amount of money um, in the capital, non-recurring capital improvement plan um, earmarked for security that related to this school that was, you know, c kind of the bone of contention. It was a very stripped down project. More, uh, I think it was maybe uh, $37,000 or something like that. So there is money that we have earmarked for it. I don't know if that can fall into, um, you know, the overall p project for, you know, for reimbursement purposes or whatever. But there has been, you know, let's say 370 or two, there, there has been money allocated for it. If we have the contingency money, so we're maybe around $275,000. But um, we look forward to updates on how this is going to you know, unfold and how we can get this project done. Thank you. Representative Gerber. Thank you. Uh, Bill Gerber, uh, District 4. Um, I think, I, I, well, first of all, I'd like to say this is my school. I doubt there's anyone in the room that cares more about this, this school than, than I do. My kids went there. My friends and neighbors' kids go there. Um, but I think some of this indignation may be due to a lack of memory about how this whole thing went down over the years. First of all, this walkway was not part of the ed specs for this project. Probably the only time that I can remember, this was added, this walkway was added by the RTM at the last minute at the RTM meeting. Dr. Title, the, the ed specs for this, clear, if you go and look at them, which probably none of you have in a long time, it, it was a while ago, Go and look at them. This walkway was part of the, if we have money left over, we will look at doing this, okay? This was something that I, you know, a couple of RTM members championed, uh, and it was added. But it, the project was never adequately, thoroughly costed out because it was in the other category, not like the rest of the project, which was costed out in, in detail. Um, I would also like to remind people that this pod was built, it was, it was, it was approved in 2008, 2009. There are people that are on this body now that were there then. Why didn't you care about this walkway then? This was an afterthought? Okay. I'd like to also point out that we have portables all over this town with hundreds of kids going in and out of their buildings to portables. If safety is that important, let's put an amendment together right now and get rid of those portables now, if that's that important. So I see this indignation tonight as political completely, because this is my school. That it, is, it was way more important to get these PCBs out of there Okay, and whose fault is it that we put out a bid and it came back at $700,000? Nobody. It's part of the process. 
And our people are rightfully saying, that doesn't make sense. Let's go back and fix it. Unless you want tonight to vote for $700,000 walkway. Let's do it. But otherwise, cool it. Representative Iacono. Representative Iacono, District 9. I resent those comments deeply. We have a plan in place to help with the portables. There's a long range facilities plan at the Board of Education to start to get rid of them. And many of us have voted in favor of doing that. We also appropriated on this body, I believe unanimously, to support the security funding to make those portables more secure. I don't think there's anybody on this body that wants to spend $700,000 on a ridiculous bid that came in. And I get that. The point, and I understand that this was not in the ed spec. I think we all understand that this was not in the ed spec. And I certainly remember Dr. Title saying that if this wasn't, they didn't have the money, it wouldn't get done. That's outside of this scope. What we're speaking here tonight is the fact that this body has repeatedly given direction, has gone out of their way to try and make this walkway happen, and nobody else picked up the ball to do that. We did, unanimously, bipartisan, Democrats and Republicans saying, we will find you the money. We even went so far as to get bond counsel back in here to see if we could start the bonding ourselves. There's no indignation. There's anger and frustration over government failure and somebody not taking the lead, or somebody's. But this body wasn't the body that didn't take the lead. This body has tried. This previous body that sat before us that I was not on tried, and this body. But it has fallen on deaf ears. And this got screwed up from go because of scope creep. Period, end of discussion. Nobody else wants to call it out. I'm calling it out. It got screwed up from scope creep. We get angry about these building committees and scope creep, and that's what this was. The building committee put in a full-on hallway. We wanted an enclosed walkway. It came back too expensive, and nobody told them to go back and redo it. That's what I'm upset about. Any other members wish to speak? Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. The last item on the agenda is to consider and act upon any other matters presented to said meeting and which may be properly acted upon under the rules of the representative town meeting. Seeing none, I'll entertain a, rep a motion to adjourn Representative Dean, Representative Caffarelli. We stand adjourned at 10 o'clock. Thank you.